It's been decades since Canada's biggest sex abuse scandal was first exposed. More than 300 boys were physically and sexually abused by members of the Christian Brothers at the Mount Cashel Orphanage in Newfoundland and Labrador. Those who survived it are still fighting the Catholic Church over it. Sexually abused, I mean beaten by day and sexually abused by night. He would put me on his knee and he would uh, slip his tongue into my mouth and get me to bite on his tongue. I couldn't understand why he was doing this to me, you know, because I thought he liked me. And I thought if we had eight or ten mount cashews, what a wonderful place it would have been for the orphans and the, the type of youth that they looked after. We went to see Brother Ringley's and the son of a bitch gave us a couple of blows to the head. And they brought me back to Mount Cashel Orphanage and they brought me into the front door and they handed me, they literally picked me up and handed me to the same man I told him about. I often wondered, when passing by Mount Cashel Orphanage and driving home, you know, what secrets this place held within its four walls. The words he said to me, it would be in your best interest to keep your mouth shut. He told me to transfer the two brothers from communities in Newfoundland to elsewhere within the Canadian province. They told me there would be no further investigation. That was it. An operation like this affects a man's memory. I am personally uh, quite satisfied that when all the evidence is in, the people will know what happened, who made what decisions. The Christian Brothers of Ireland ran schools and institutions around the globe. They were something less than priests, but were revered as religious leaders in Catholic education. They wielded authority, often without mercy.
Terry Lemoyne is one of the little known victims of sexual abuse at Mount Cashel Orphanage. The public has never heard of Terry Lemoyne. He has never been interviewed. He never appeared at the Hughes inquiry. But he did testify in court against a Christian brother who took the seven year old Lemoyne and another child to bed nightly and sexually molested them. I'm still working on it today to, to try to find who I am because of what I went through. And and it's been it's been a roller coaster ride. I mean, personally, I mean my, my relationships with with uh, with women uh, is, is almost impossible. If they last two hours, I'm lucky. I'm doing really good, <laughs> you know. Um, I've been in various uh, treatment centers. Um, I've um, I've gone through things that I don't remember. Um, parts of the past comes up in flashbacks. Terry Lemoyne's nightmare began in 1977, more than a year after the Mount Cashel scandal was hushed up by the Justice Department and the Congregation of Christian Brothers. My confidence, my self-esteem, uh, my, uh, my childhood basically was taken from me.
Doug Kenny was the head of Mount Cashel in the mid-1970s, but he still maintains his innocence. He still describes the scandal as a conspiracy. But his refusal to admit guilt did not prevent him from getting day parole in March. He was sent to this halfway house in Ontario. He was granted full parole in September. Last month, the Supreme Court added two years to Kenny's sentence, but he won't be going back to jail. His time on parole is considered to be time served. Shane Earl, the boy who went into Mount Cashel at the age of six, is now a family man. His daughter, Courtney, is the best of many changes in his life. When Shane Earl was eight, a Christian brother beat him so badly he went to hospital. That led to the police investigation that was ultimately covered up. Shane Earl was the first to talk publicly about the abuse at the orphanage. He led the call for an inquiry. But he says his experience was humiliating. I just f felt defeated and I felt that I was being trampled on and I felt that I was being abused and misused and being taken advantage of. I felt like I was sinking and I needed to, I needed to swim ashore and get my head above water and leave.
Brother Alan Ralph was on day parole in Halifax when two new charges of sexual abuse were laid against him. In September, he was found guilty on one of those charges. In January, Ralph was released on day parole. He's forbidden from having contact with children. Brother Harold Thorne was also on day parole when he was brought back to court to face a new charge this fall. Another former resident had accused him of sexual abuse. Leave me alone. 
Thorne was found not guilty. Ironically, he admitted during the trial that there were other boys that he had abused, boys who have not come forward. Thorne was moved to the Archibald Centre, a halfway house in Thornhill, Ontario. Even when I was growing up in the orphanage, like, you know, you were given, they had this room there called a the tent room where they kept all the candy and pop and everything from uh, the, uh, the raffle on Water Street. And I remember when I was really young, 11 I guess when I went in the orphanage, and when everything first started happening. Then after it was all over, they would take you and uh, give you a pop or candy, things like that, and that's pretty well, like, you know, what I knew, like, you know, I didn't have any education when I left the orphanage, and uh, I just knew that, like, you know, if I <laughs> gave somebody what they wanted, then I would get something in return, and that's all I knew, really. Ironically, Brinston lives just blocks away from one of the brothers who abused him, Brother Edward French. French was paroled after eight months in prison. It uh, breaks my heart that, like, you know, that I have to sit here and, like, you know, uh, I, I don't know, it's, like, you know, most of them that were sentenced and things like that are out and I feel like I'm the one that's really doing time. You regret coming forward? Yeah. yeah. It caused more pain than I can hope. And then it, it was confusing at times with, I was confusing love with pity. And I didn't want pity. I needed somebody to reach out and tell me that they love me, right? And that's all I needed, like, you know, all my life, really. If I had to have that, then maybe, you know, my life would have been much different, right? But, like, you know, I look at my brothers at home, and just the thought, like, you know, if, if I could have been like them, I could always be home and have children, like, you know, a happy life. And now I sit and reflect, like, that I'll never have, like, none of that. And it hurts.
David Burton was first convicted of sexual abuse at Mount Cashel in 1982. A Newfoundland appeal court reduced his sentence to 12 days. Last year, Burton was convicted on another charge of abuse. He confessed and gave police the names of five other boys he had abused. None of them, now in their 20s and 30s, would agree to come forward. They said it would be too hard on them and their families. This is the congregation's retreat center in Mona Mills, just outside Toronto. David Burton lives with two other brothers in a home nearby. Schools in Ontario's Catholic system now send children and teachers here for retreats. David Burton works in Mississauga at Plas Tech. It's a factory run by a former resident of Mount Cashel Orphanage, Bill Hickey.
It's official. The Mount Cashel Orphanage, once the respected symbol of Newfoundland charity, is closing. The announcement was made today in St. John's by the Christian Brothers, the religious order that runs Mount Cashel. The orphanage is now mired in scandal involving sexual and physical abuse of boys who lived there and the alleged cover-up of a police investigation. Chris Decker is Acting Minister of Social Services in Newfoundland. Mr. Decker, who made the actual decision to close Mount Cashel? It was a decision which was made by the congregation of Christian brothers themselves. The government did not uh, make the decision. We talked to the leader of the Christian brother, brother Frank uh, Heptich, on Friday. He said he was having discussions with the Newfoundland government. Um, what, can you give me a, an idea of what those discussions were about? Was it timing or the decision or what? Yes, it was mostly about the timing, I guess, and also the decision. He exp expressed uh, grave concerns. Uh, I was there representing the government at the meetings, and uh, he was very concerned about the, the pressure and the strains which have been placed on the boys in their home over the past months. He's concerned about the pressure on staff as well, and uh, in, in, in that, uh, that, I think that's what uh, was the determining factor where he made a decision. Lumby is a small resource-based town nestled below the mountains, and it's home to Stephen Rooney. Stephen Rooney is the man who sexually abused Terry Lemoyne and another child. He was paroled in July of 1993. Until very recently, Rooney was selling advertising for this Lumby newspaper.
Kevin Short was living in Vancouver, working as a principal in a Christian Brothers school when he was arrested. He pleaded guilty and was paroled after eight months. He now lives on the outskirts of Toronto in Scarborough.
brother Edward English is still in jail. English is the only brother to serve all of his sentence inside the walls of Dorchester Prison. At least two of the brothers were sent to these Westmoreland minimum security townhouses. Some corrections officials refer to them as condos. English is now eligible to apply for day parole. For more than four decades, physical and sexual abuse at Newfoundland's Mount Cashel Orphanage was suppressed by a code of silence, a cover-up that finally ended in 1989. Then I felt a, a pain. Some survivors have since received compensation, but others are still pursuing justice, including this 80-year-old man and three others who were identified legally as John Doe. He was physically and sexually abused over an eight-year period, ending in 1955. Sexual abuse, at night time they come to your bed and uh, they do what they... Uh, no, I won't describe it in detail, but they were sexual abuse and uh, the physical was horrendous. What the big thing about the decision is that people in higher authority have decided that the Catholic Church, the Episcopal Corporation, were guilty of negligence in their duty toward the boys in Mount Cashel. And that's the big thing. Some days John Doe wishes he never came forward. Sometimes I think maybe I shouldn't have said anything and just kept my mouth shut. And I would have lived my life and, and died and not said anything. At least I would have had that peace, which is no peace. There's been a court-ordered publication ban on John Doe's identity for 13 years, ever since he came forward with allegations of abuse against Father George Smith. Some of that abuse was so horrific, he couldn't tell the court or the RCMP. To this day, I can't admit some of the stuff that happened to me. But it's hard to say that, you know, that you're being sodomized when you're six or seven years old. Smith was convicted in 2013 and sentenced to 11 years, but only served four before getting parole. It's been nine years since John Doe sued the Diocese of St. George's on Newfoundland's west coast. Nine years, he says, of fighting hurdles put up by the church. How much longer does... Uh, does the Diocese of St. George's want this to drag out another 50? Just, you know, just get this, give, give the victim some closure mm -hmm. so we can move on with our lives, right? A lawyer for the diocese refused to comment on the case, saying it would be inappropriate to comment on something before the courts. John Doe's frustrations are mounting as the church prepares settlements with more than 200 people in the St. John's region. Survivors of abuse at Mount Cashel and other Catholic institutions are expected to be paid out in the coming months. But on the West Coast, John Doe says survivors there continue to be re-traumatized as the civil suit drags on. This process now has is, is been a part of my life for well over 50 years. And uh, at some point, you know, you just want closure. Until a settlement is reached, John Doe says he'll continue to be haunted by George Smith and his unspeakable actions.
1975, Bobby Connors gave police a statement alleging that brothers English, Ralph, Burke and Kenny were abusing boys at Mount Cashel Orphanage. The door was closed. If only they'd listened. Bob Connors was at Mount Cashel with his little brothers, Darren and Greg. He gave a statement to police in 1975, and that statement was buried as part of a cover-up by the brothers, police and justice department. The investigating officer pointed the blame to police chief John Lawler. Mr. Lawley, you seem to be passing the blame on either to the officers beneath you or to the officials above you. That's what you're, that's what you're saying, not me. You're saying this. Oh, you're... I'm not blaming anyone. Lawler's own son was a Christian brother, later accused of abusing boys at Mount Cashel in the 1960s. The cover-up haunts Bob Connors to this day. We told our stories. And I think the bottom line was, I don't think anybody believed us, right? So, I know that eventually these brothers were moved or transported or, or taken somewhere else and, and we figured that was the end of it, right? So, but, but then we find out afterwards that they were taken to other schools and moved to other areas and all they were doing was just spreading out, spreading the disease as far as I was concerned, right? So. Ten years later, Colin Wilson was a grade 9 student at Vancouver College. His class clown antics caught the attention of his teacher, Joseph Burke. Wilson says Burke took him and three other boys under his wing. They meet in his office at the back of the cafeteria, one at a time while the others waited outside. I'd get hit and it was probably up to ten times um, over the pants with, uh, with his hand. That was stage one. Stage two was if you, he felt that you needed more punishment, he would pull out, uh, he would make you pull out of the top drawer a piece of wood, probably the consistency of a hockey stick, um, maybe that long, and pull that out. Uh, again, assume the position you'd lay across his desk and um, he would hit you with that, which was way more painful than his hand and he would always threaten you with stage three, which was the bare bottom spanking. Wilson says Burke went to step three one night in December 1985. It was too late to stay in his office, so Wilson says they locked up the school and left. We got into his van, it's dark, we drive into the Mar Marpole area to his apartment. He then uh, asked me to drop my pants, which I did, and I stood there in my underwear, and he said all of it. Um, at this point, I'm like crying, snot, and everything coming out of my nose, and put me across his lap and um, hit me. Um, yeah, probably the normal ten times, and and then made me go back, dress myself, and uh, we got back into his. Uh, uh, into his van, he dropped me at the closest bus stop that would get me back to Richmond and, um, and I never told my parents. Wilson says those experiences followed him after Vancouver College. He was diagnosed with anxiety in the 90s and he battled addiction over the past 30 years. I just recently did a stint in a, in a recovery center for alcohol abuse. Um, and when I was in there, I had to go back into my past and I had to find, we did a session where I had to find traumas in my past. Wilson says that inspired him to see whatever happened to Burke, but he wasn't prepared for what he found. Darren Connors was also wrecked by the outcome. Joe Burke's a piece of garbage. Joe Burke should go to jail. Joe Burke did what he did. You know, if he was here, you know, I, I, you know, I said it to his face in court, and I'll say it to him again anytime, anywhere, any place. The man did what he did. He did it to me. He did it to a number of other people. He's a statistic bastard. Bob Connor says his little brother never recovered from Mount Cashel or the sting of being disbelieved. Darren struggled. Darren and my other brother, Greg, they both struggled big time, right? I think because I latched on and I got married and I had support, they never had the support like I had, right? 
So I think it was hard for them, and, and especially relationship-wise. They couldn't have relationships, right, either one of them. So I think they bonded together, they moved in together and bonded with each other, and that was their support. That bond was eternal. Greg Connors died by suicide in 2014, and Darren followed in 2016, in the same room where his brother died. I think Greg and Darren just gave up, right? They just, there was no other way out for them. And eventually they took their lives, right? And it all had to do because of what happened in Mount Cashel. In the 1970s, people weren't ready to believe the Christian brothers could do any wrong. The truth was, dozens of kids at Mount Cashel were being abused, and some tried to tell the authorities. I'm going to tell you the story of stuff that happened to me that people are not going to believe. But as horrific as it may sound, it is true. Like many kids at Mount Cashel, Kevin Little came from a broken home in rural Newfoundland. His parents were unable to care for all the kids in a house without running water or electricity, so Little joined about 90 other boys at Mount Cashel Orphanage in St. John's. Little was placed in a dormitory under the care of Brother Joseph Burke. Burke has always denied abusing kids, though he's been accused by at least eight men in criminal and civil court. Little says Burke would often drag him away from the others, taking him to his private office, alone and scared. Well, you'd make me take off my clothes. And he, um, he'd make me, sometimes I'd be in the nude, and sometimes he'd, he'd, he'd flick my um, genital area. He would make me lift my arms and pinch the skin and haul the skin away. That's what he did on a regular basis. And I was a frightened dead as a man for every little thing I'd done. Every day, I was always looking over my shoulder, afraid that Brother Burke was gonna come and grab me. Burke had me scared on a daily basis. 15 years after the cover-up, the story broke. I am not certain whether... A judicial inquiry led to charges against 14 men. Thank you. Burke was convicted of assaulting four children, including Kevin Little and Bob Connor's youngest brother, Darren. However, all but one conviction was overturned by the Supreme Court of Canada. On the one remaining, Burke got a conditional discharge for common assault. No criminal record. I don't feel ecstatic about it. I'm still very angry that it happened in the first place. That I was found guilty of things that I don't even think about. No, I'm, I gave seven years of my life to that province and they took seven more. The Supreme Court questioned the boys' stories, saying Little in particular was, quote, too bizarre to accept. Today, Little says the pain of it all nearly killed him. He blew a career in the military 
and attempted suicide when he was 18. But like I didn't understand. Because I was physically an adult, I was mentally still a child. Like I never had a chance to grow up. I wasn't had that, never had a chance to be taught to be safe and secure like a child should be. Of the brothers convicted, none were able to return to teaching, except Joseph Burke. Fresh off his conditional discharge, he returned to Vancouver College. He taught until 2013, when he retired amid an investigation into his disciplinary tactics. No. I don't know if you know Sermon of the Mount, uh, where Jesus preached, beware of wolves in sheep's clothing. Well, that's what Mr. Burke was. He, he was able to manipulate the situation and, and be your friend, and then on the flip side, turn into this evil man. And, and um, he's a very sick individual. He's caused a lot of pain for a lot of people.
Vancouver. Joe Burke was living here when the Mount Cashel scandal broke five years ago. He was vice principal of a school run by the Christian Brothers. Burke still lives in Vancouver, on this street, in this house. He never went to prison. His lawyers continue to appeal his conviction. Vancouver is also home to another convicted brother, Edward French. French now lives in this upscale West End neighborhood. He lives in this stylish high-rise overlooking beautiful English Bay. Did you uh, in any way directly or indirectly give any instructions that the investigation, this investigation should be discontinued? No. There's still a large number of people out there who say this problem is blown out of proportion. 
Well, uh, you know, I guess it really depends on your point of view. If you think that 14 or 1,500 children alleged to be involved with sexual relationships with adults is something that's blown out of proportion, I'd say in proportion to what? To me, there will never be a thing called closure. I don't know what that is. This man spent eight years there in the 1950s. His identity is protected by a court order. The church is responsible for this, then the church has to pay. You know, if it means taking the churches to schools to pay for that, so be it. Sorry just doesn't cut it. Sorry can't uh, give me back something that's been taken away. And as each one goes to prison, like, you know, they still deny everything. And, like, you know, they ruin so many people's lives. People who take on the responsibility of looking after children and then abuse them are evil. It's like being a Vietnam vet. You've been through a war, and you've seen a lot of tragedy in that war, and it's something that you will have to deal with. Suicide is a is a, is a, is on the top of the list of things that would have that can take place. I lie in bed at night, sometimes three and four in the morning, and just think of these men. I mean, I, I dare to call them men because I don't. I mean, to me, they're not men. They're 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 monsters.